Welcome back, and we are here finishing up Section 2-3 today. These notes should go a lot quicker than the last ones. There was a lot that we did in the last. So just to recap, we were working with um, histograms, uh, frequency polygons, and OGIVs. And we're going to do that for this data right here. Now this is in your book. If you look at the right page, you can copy this table down. But it says construct a histogram, frequency, polygon, and OGIV using relative frequencies to represent the data shown for the distribution shown here of the miles that 20 randomly selected runners ran during a given week. I myself only run if somebody's chasing me. but. Here's the data that we have, and the difference is we're going to be using the uh, relative frequencies. So your first step when you're doing this, well, you hopefully already know how to do the frequency and the cumulative frequency where you just add the given frequency to the one before it. So uh, just to recap, 1 plus 2 gave us 3, 3 plus 3 gives us 6, and so on down n equal 20 is the total number of data uh, values that we have to find the midpoint if you take your class boundaries sum them and divide by two that'll give you the midpoint so to fill in the midpoints you have from top to bottom you can fill this in on your notes 8 13 18 23 28 33 and 38 again you just add the two class boundaries 5.5 plus 10.5 and divide by two and um, the first step, it says, is to convert each frequency to a proportion. Relative frequency by dividing the frequency for each class by the total number of observations. So, for example, we're going to take this frequency 1 and we're going to divide it by the total. 1 divided by 20 is going to give us our first relative frequency. Relative frequencies should always be less than 1. Then we're going to place these values in the com column labeled relative frequency. And that's all written on your notes for you. So when I divide 1 by 20, I get 0.05. The next one I'm going to do is 2 divided by 20, which gives me 0.10. 3 divided by 20 is going to give me 0.15, and so on. So complete those all the way down. If I add it up, it should equal out to 1. 1 is the same as 100% cumulative relative frequency you do just like you did the cumulative frequency so we're going to start off with 0.05 and then we're going to add it to the 0.10 put that over to the right add that one to 0.15 put that over to the right and so on so we start with 0.05 0.05 plus 0.10 is 0.15 0.15 plus 0.15 is 0.30 and you get the gist so you can do the rest of those all the way down Okay, and then notice the total here matches the total here. So now it's just a question of graphing. Now, before we use the, the relative frequencies and the, the frequencies to do our graphs, we're going to be incorporating the cumulative relative frequencies and the relative frequencies instead of the frequencies and the cumulative frequency. But you use them in the same spot. So let me show you what I mean. We're going to draw each graph, histogram and OGIV, for the histogram and OGIV, you use the class boundaries along the x-axis. For frequency polygon, we're using the midpoints. The scale on the y-axis uses the proportion, so it's using these decimals over here. That's the difference. So if you notice, I've got my relative frequencies here. Before we had just regular frequencies when we did the histogram. And then you do your bar charts. So the first one up is to 0.5 and then you do a height of 0.10 and 0.15 and 0.25 and you draw those bars in. I put the little decimals there just to kind of show you where those heights would be and how they correspond to your chart. So boom, histogram done. Let's head over to the frequency polygon. So again we use relative frequencies. The difference is we're using the midpoints along the bottom here instead of the boundaries. So frequency polygon, you use the midpoints, and then you got the regular frequencies over here to the right. Then we plot the points. So 8 is 0 0.05, then 13, 18, and we use those midpoints, and then you just connect those with a straight line. They also like for you to connect the graphs at the end of this one, so you connect it to the beginning and the end, same distance as the 
the distance between your tick marks. Notice also I have my labels. There's miles and relative frequency. So make sure that you always label your charts. Draw an OGIV using cumulative frequencies. So we're doing cumulative frequency over here. So I went from 20 to 100. I still did, I did five marks. You could do 10 if you wanted to go by tenths. But uh, again, we use the um, class boundaries down here. And remember when you're starting with an OGIV, you always start, since it's cumulative, the first guy is zero. Then when you get to the end boundaries for that first class, you um, go up to the cumulative frequency. So our first dot is actually at 10.5, and we put what the cumulative frequency was, which I think was 0.05. And then the cumulative frequency, the next one was uh, 0.10. And then we go on up and we plot those cumulative frequencies. This should always curve up and we get to the end there, we connect it with the beginning. This one's zero because when you first start out you don't have any data points, but by the end of that first class you have some data points. So then we just connect those dots and notice it curves up. And that can analyze your data as to where it curves. It curves early on or at the end as to where your data falls. Okay, distribution shapes. So these, kind of, these should make sense. All you have to do is draw these. These are all in your book, but you might want to pause it if you want a little more time to draw. You can see that this is a bell shape. And the description they give is there's a single t peak and it tapers off at both ends. The next shape is uniform. And if you look at the uniform, it does kind of look like a rectangle. It's flat or rectangular. That's the uniform shape. Then you have the J shaped, and that definitely makes sense. This looks like a J. All right. And so this one, it has a few values on the left and then increases as one moves to the right. That's the J-shaped drawing. The reverse J is the opposite of the J. So there's a few values on the right side and it decreases as one moves to the right. Then you've got the right skewed. Now this one doesn't make sense because if I look at this, all the data is over here on the left, but they call it right skewed. It's exactly opposite of what you would think it would be, but think about where it tapers off. This tapers off to the right, so they call it a right skew. So peak is to the left, and data values taper off to the right. So the, the peak is to the left, but since it's right skewed, say, okay, the data tapers to the right. And F, the left skewed, the description here is that the peak is to the right, and data values taper off to the left. Oh. Yeah, so the data values to the left are smaller than the ones on the right. It kind of looks a little like the J, doesn't it? All righty, I think that'll do her for, oh, sorry, we got a couple more of these. Bimodal, I forgot, we got the double peak. So two peaks of the same height. You can see you have two peaks of the same height. Bimodal means two, so you've got two distributions of the data on this one. The U shape is also bimodal. It has two peaks but it has the U type of shape. It, that's high on the ends, so peaks at the ends and it's low in the middle. The reason these graphs are good is that we can, and knowing the shapes is, is a good tool to have, is because you can analyze where your data falls. So when you're analyzing histograms and frequency polygons, you can look at the shape of the curve. Things that you look for is, is it bimodal? Modal? Does it have one or two peaks? Is it f relatively f flat or U shape? Are the data spread out or are they clustered in one particular area? The, are the data values extreme at the ends? These may be outliers. So outliers are data points that are like outside where most things are. Are there gaps in the histogram or does the frequency polygon touch the x-axis somewhere other than at the ends? Finally, are the data clustered around uh, at one end or the other indicating skewed? Um, distribution, all these things give us clues to how people responded to a survey or our data collection. And um, last but not least, it says the histogram for the record high temperatures, that was earlier on your, in your notes, it shows single peak distribution with uh, 109.5 to 114.5 containing the largest number of temperatures, that means most of the state's record highs between that data, that data range. 
those two temperatures. The distribution has no gaps and there are fewer temperatures in the highest class than the lowest class. Well, that can indicate that um, it's warmer than it is colder in most of the United States. We all don't live in Alaska. All right, that wraps up 2-3. Woohoo! And I will see you tomorrow.